Okay, cool. All right. Well, I hope everybody's staying safe in the in the crazy times. Um, a couple quick announcements um, that you guys may or may not have seen, but uh, I didn't think there was any doubt, but just to be clear, campus officially notified us that uh, we um, are definitely going to be virtual in the spring, spring semester. Um, and uh, again, that, that didn't seem to be a surprise to anybody that has any sense of what's going on. Um, unclear if we're going to end virtually. Ideally, we would, the vaccine and stuff would come along and, you know, who knows, February-ish, something like that, and people could get vaccinated and we could return to campus by the end of the semester, but at least we're all going to start and, and plan for being, um, being virtual, just, uh, just so... Um, you know that, and you might have also seen the news that somebody on campus, one of our uh, courses that um, has in-person on campus, so no ESRM people, uh, no ESRM classes have have in-class and, or excuse me, in-person and on campus. So we, you know, obviously we're going to try to do our field trips starting in a few weeks and stuff, but but uh, none of our program has that. Um, a few programs do, and it seems as if one of those um, courses where the students came physically into the lab, someone uh, contracted uh, COVID, unfortunately. He or she is apparently okay. They're not, they're not in the hospital or anything, but it, it uh, just points out the reason why we um, haven't been able to do traditional face-to-face -face right now. So thankfully, everybody's okay, but um, it's causing a bit of a it's causing many meetings for me to be in <laughs> to discuss various things with various people, even though it wasn't an ESRM person. Okay, all right, great. So let's let's uh, keep going. Um, looks like most people are here now. So um, uh, cool. So I want to let me share my screen with you guys first before we get going. And if anybody has any uh, burning questions, go ahead and and ask me, but uh, if not, we'll just get going into our first uh, first thing. So, okay, everybody can see my, everybody can see my slides? Yep. Cool, yep. all right. So um, I think probably this week, maybe next week, and then we're gonna be transitioning to me trying to do most of these lecture, longer lectures things recorded. And then we'll have more of a discussion type of uh, time and, and more interaction based, primarily interaction based um, um, simultaneous sessions or our, our virtual field trips uh, uh, during this time slot. Um, but uh, today's one and, and probably next week too that I want to go through and have, um, I, I didn't think recording, purely recording the lecture and have you guys watching it was maybe the best way. And so, um, but again, I'm still experimenting and love to hear feedback from you guys. So again, we're talking about, uh, we're still in our, in our conceptual introduction to restorations. And, and remember, you guys interrupt me if anything I say doesn't make sense or, or something is crazy. Uh, I'm also trying a new room today. So uh, you guys can tell me if you like my, uh, my, my downstairs over here. A um, little bit of review, let's just start with. Uh, so again, we, we talked last time about there's a lot of different terms for restoration. People use a lot of different, um, oh yeah, no, I got that recording, right? I do have this recording, don't I? Before I go on, sorry. Yeah, okay, good recording. Um, uh, anyway, so there's a lot of different terms we use for restorations, and uh, some people sort of make their whole careers on inventing new new terms. But we mentioned for our class, we're going to use try to stick to primarily these three main terms: um, enhancement, where we're doing some stuff a bit more on the margins, say controlling invasive species or something like that, a, a, a relatively focused. And relatively limited intervention. Restoration would be the typical thing I think most of us think about. There was a wetland, it got screwed up, we're trying to make another wetland. Uh, and then creation would be, um, we didn't have a wetland, it was a grassland, and we want to turn it into a, uh, a different system than, than was historically there. So we'd use the term creation for that. So enhancement, restoration, and creation. Um, and then we we hit on this um, really key graph. Uh, for me, it's it's very important in terms of the conceptual laying out of restoration. And again, to re review that, that was uh, there's some metric of time on the x-axis, some metric of of ecological functioning, 
uh, on the y axis and we're going from uh, the degraded state that's that's what's motivating us to do the restoration in the first place but we're, we're going from some degraded state ideally up swooping up into this uh, sort of explosion symbol here of better functioning at some point in the future or that desired state well that'd be great we oftentimes don't quite get there we end up in some alternative state alternate state which might not be ideal but oftentimes is if done well is at least better than the degraded level of functioning of the, the degraded state um, but if done poorly, it, it might get better for a little bit and then just decline and, and either back to where we started from or even worse, uh, more degraded than where we started from. So that, that's, the con that's the concept after uh, Hobbes and Norton's um, uh, diagram. Uh, and then we, we ended last time by, by talking a little bit about um, uh, just the increasing popularity of restoration. We talked about um, hey, we saw this increased success in terms of the publication, and then you guys went and did a, a quick literature search, and you, we found that indeed this trend of increasing um, mentions and therefore presumably increasing popularity uh, is is continuing on. And that's with regards to restoration, that's with regards to wetland restoration, all the stuff we are talking about in our class. Okay, so let's pick up uh, some new stuff. So. Um, Next, so there's sort of two, there's a terminology, which is one part, and there's that one key take home, which is the Hobbes and Norton diagram of, of the concept of restoration. The other uh, take home that we haven't gotten to, that we're gonna talk about now, is this notion of, of um, how, do we, how do we take the temperature of a re restoration? How do we take the blood pressure of a restoration? How do we check the health of the system? and and understand if the um, if the project is 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 working or not. Um, and <coughs> as we'll see when we go on here, um, what I'm going to argue uh, is that simplistic tools can lead you astray, and lame tools will always lead you astray. So simplistic isn't necessarily bad, but but tools that focus a bit too much on the the very uh, there's huge value in doing a rapid assessment, a quick look, um, a, a, you know, a, a quick taking of the pulse very, very quickly. There's obviously benefits to that. But if we're solely relying on quick pulse checks, that's not going to tell us necessarily if we have COVID, right, by analogy. So, so simplistic tools can lead us astray, but lame tools almost assuredly will leave us, uh, lead us astray. What do I mean by that? Okay, so uh, our first breakout room, because I decided that, you know, me talking for an hour and then you guys falling asleep and watching, you know, my lameness for an hour, that's not a great way to, to have an interactive class session. So um, we're going to start with an interactive class session. And so this is what I want you guys to do. So before we get into more of the details and my explaining certain things, um, I want you guys just to brainstorm for a few minutes. So I'm going to throw you guys into a breakout room. And here's, here's the operating, here's our guide. So the guide is uh, what might we want to measure? So we're gonna put in our heads uh, a wetland restoration. Could be something like Magoo Lagoon. It could be something on campus. It could be something wherever you, you, you want to conceptualize. But for concreteness, it's gonna be a wetland and it's gonna be a restoration that we just did. And so let's say we just did it. And now what do we wanna measure to see, did we do a good job? Um, is it, is it um, you know, doing kind of better than it was? Is it doing a lot better than it was? Is it totally kick butt kind of, or is it, has it completely imploded? That type of thing. So I'm gonna to toss you guys into a breakout room, uh, into various breakout rooms in a minute. And then um, I want you guys to spend, say about maybe, um, so again, first, since we're still all learning each other's names, it, give ourselves a quick introduction, say, say your name and, and say hi to everybody for uh, 30 seconds or so. And then let's take about um, five minutes. And I want you guys to just um, kick around some ideas. Well, maybe we could measure blah, blah, blah. Or maybe we can measure blah, 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 right? And be as specific as you can. Um, so if you were, if you, you know, I wouldn't say measure animals, right? Say, oh, I wanna measure, uh, I don't know, woodpeckers or clapper rails or, you know, a certain kind of animal, bird or animal or, or critter or whatever. Um, and then after about five minutes of, of 
kicking around ideas and everybody should, and maybe we need a little bit more, maybe it needs, maybe it needs 10 minutes or so, but, but I want everybody to have voiced an idea or two at least. And maybe blah, 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 maybe blah, blah, blah. And that um, can then maybe inspire the next person to say, oh, that's a good one. Maybe we could also do blah, blah, blah. And then after, uh, let's call it 10 minutes, after the first 10 minutes, um, I want you guys to discuss those. So everybody should have had a chance to, to voice a couple, you know, think about it for a minute or two, and then, and then uh, voice a couple of those. And, uh, and then sort of, you know, debate. And, and get some initial feedback like, yeah, you know, I don't know if that's the best one or maybe we, you could take that idea, but maybe you could make it a modify it into this or, or what have you. And then, um, and, then the, and then when we end, so uh, say if we need 10 minutes, we'll, we'll say in 15 minutes, in 15 minutes, I want you guys to have entered. Um, so I'm gonna put you into groups of about six people Right, so I want each group to not not every person has to do this, but one person from each group is is fine. But um, if you guys could enter, uh, or or you could do it individually if you just want to each take your your idea and enter it. But um, but those ideas that you generated and then vetted at least initially in your group, um, I want you guys to enter them into the. Uh, I just activated a new poll, and so this poll is one where you're going to be able to just type in an answer. And for now, you're just gonna type in the answer. After I talk for a bit and we, we, we discuss some things and then we'll come back into small groups again, I want you guys, we'll, we'll sort of vote and decide which of these seems to be the best of the ideas. But for now, all you're gonna do is get in the breakout rooms, come up with some ideas, you know, have a, a quick and dirty, you know, is this, is this cool? And does this make sense? And then after everybody's voiced some ideas and, and, and we've had a, at least a brief chance to discuss each of those, then I want you guys to enter those into the poll. Again, you can decide if you wanna have one person from the group enter all of them, or if you each wanna enter your one or two, it doesn't matter to me. But again, the poll is gonna, and I'll, I'll throw this in the chat once I put everybody into the um, breakout rooms. But again, it says polled.com, Sean Anderson 380. It's the same link. If you guys haven't figured it out, it's the same link whenever I'm doing these polls, I just activate one. So if you just save that link you know, to your desktop or, or a quick, quick, uh, you know, in, in a um, note or somewhere, whenever we do these things for the, this semester, this is, this is the link we'll use. And it'll just be, I'll, I'll turn on a poll and turn it off. So when you go there, you'll, you'll see different um, poll options or, or response options, but it's the same link that you guys need to click. Cool. Uh, questions before I, I toss you guys into the groups. Okay, so I'm gonna start my I'm gonna start my timer. We'll, we'll we'll say 15 minutes, and if and if that's I'll I'll try to pop into some different groups. If that seems too long, we can we can end it sooner. But I think you know by the time everybody introduces themselves and everybody has a few minutes to chat, I think I think 15 is probably gonna be about right. So um, so unless there's questions. Okay, I'm gonna to toss you guys into breakout rooms. Give me one second here. Okay, here you go. So I'll start my timer and I'll, I'll send you guys a, a general text or in the chat, I'll send you a notice when we're about five minutes from uh, coming back together. Awesome, thanks you guys. So what might we want to measure in a wetland restoration? All right, team. Are we in your office today, Dr. A? Uh, no, now we're, we're downstairs. And I thought the weird golden light of Hades would be an interesting light, but I think it just makes it look weird. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Next, yeah, we're going to be on the roof. We're going to be outside. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, the, the, uh, the sun was really orange yesterday. It seems more yellowy today. Definitely. My, my, uh, my parents up in the Bay Area were sending me pictures of just crazy stuff like inside their house. It was, uh, <laughs> it looked like it was a nighttime Halloween photo. I was like, where, where the hell is that? I said, oh, it's, it's 11 a.m. in the morning. It was, it was crazy. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. 
Insane. All right, cool. I think everybody's back. It looks like everybody's back. Okay, cool. Thanks, you guys. Um, so real quick, was I, I popped in a couple rooms, but I didn't get to everybody's room. Was that was 15 minutes too long, you guys think, for that little brainstorming thing? Should I have gone shorter? Do you guys need more time? What was your general? A little more time would have been nice. A little more time. Okay. okay so, so next time, I'll give us some more time. So we're going to do this again, so don't stress. So thanks. So next time, we'll do maybe like 20 minutes or so. Like, like 20 minutes, do you think, more time, or even longer than that, you think? I didn't quite finish. Uh, Professor, I didn't quite finish the survey. Okay, that's cool. Well, you, you guys can you guys can add some stuff in if you want right now, but we're going to come back to it in a few minutes, so you'll be able to add to it again. This was just sort of our first draft. Oh, okay. But, but if we did a similar thing, you guys think I should give you more like 20 minutes or that I should give you more like 30 minutes, you think, for that type of deal? I feel like 20 minutes is a good amount. Okay, okay perfect. Thanks for, thanks for the feedback, you guys. Yeah, so, 20 um, minutes is good. I think, okay, perfect, thank you. I think everybody can see my screen. You guys can see the screen right now? Yeah. Okay, so it looks yeah. like just so far from our first, first, uh, you know, going around, it looks like uh, vegetation that really likes to be wet or needs to be wet is pretty high. Um, something about the soil quality, something about soil organic, uh, sedimentation, cool. I like these, these are good, these are good. rainfall. Um, Which one uh, we're missing? So that's good. What's that? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, so, that was background noise at my house. Okay, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> so, sorry, that's a good question. So anyway, so okay, so good. So we, we got a, a a good start on these things. So birds, water, uh, length. I guess that is um, cool. Um, so awesome. All right. Um, let's get back to uh, our, our introduction. Our introduction here. Let me get you guys. So you can see this. Okay. Cool. Um, excellent. Great. Uh, and I got to hide this because this is blocking my view. Okay. Um, all right. So what do, so you guys have some great examples here. I like a lot of these examples. Typical metrics that we would use to assess a wetland restoration. Um, focus on the biological goings on. You guys were suggesting things like um, um, soil properties, uh, 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 hydrology, which are great. Traditionally, um, we would probably never just do those things. So, so I don't know of a, wet, of a of let's say a wetland restoration project that doesn't have at least some biological metrics. They don't all always have those those abiotic, those those chemical or those um, geomorphological uh, metrics necessarily, but they always have at least biological ones. And so I would say some of the typical biological ones that you see are listed here. So th these are all taken from different uh, projects that I've either worked on or evaluated. Um, and so something like this, something uh, like, you know, we want to restore um, a wetland such that, or we'll consider it a success such that it would have 80% cover of native salt marsh vegetation after five, five years after construction or five years after the major um, activity was, was uh, conducted. And, and you'll find percent cover of vegetation is a very common metric, either for things we want, such as native critters, or things we don't want, such as invasive species, we want the, that, that percentage to be low. Um, then we have something like uh, uh, focus on, um, organisms of concern. Again, these could be either uh, centerpiece critters, so, so you know, key, key elements of the wetland, or it could be something like an endangered species, or again, it could be something like an invasive that we're trying to make sure isn't around. But, here, uh, but in this case, it would be um, where restoration would be a success if we had native salt marsh species evident uh, by the end of five years. So there's nothing wrong with these metrics. These are good metrics. The, the problem is if, that, if that, that were to be the only thing we would evaluate. So if, we, if our entire assessment was based solely on vegetative cover, if our entire assessment was solely based on the presence or absence of some native species, as I've seen many examples of over the years, um, that is a simplistic way to look at an ecosystem and while it might work, in my experience, these simplistic uh, assessments oftentimes allow inadequate restoration or, or inadequate performance 
to be considered adequate because, hey, no, you said I had to have 80% cover and I did. Doesn't matter whatever else is going on. It just says, oh, I did that. Therefore, I'm a success. Okay. So this is, this is my classic story of, of why this is a problem. So this is from a friend of mine. His name is Mark Sudal. He um, uh, was a Navy guy and, and now, or I don't know still, but I, th I think still, um, uh, is a big, big uh, high up in the Army Corps of Engineers in their, in their wetland lab. And when he was doing his graduate work, this is data from Orange County, South Orange County, or no, I guess all of Orange County overall. Um, this is essentially data from his, his um, uh, graduate career. And what he did for his graduate career is he was working for the Army Corps of Engineers while he was in grad school. And um, uh, so, so he decided to, he was interested in this topic and he decided to look at the projects, wetland projects that the Army Corps had uh, permitted. We'll, we'll go into this in, a, in, a, in future weeks about how the permitting thing works and stuff. But suffice it to say, the Army Corps of Engineers is typically one of the um, main uh, uh, entities that will say, um, if you need to do a restoration, and if you need to do a restoration, they have to approve it, that kind of thing. And so these are all projects that um, uh, he approved. So we're looking at, um, I should know the number off the top of my head, I can't remember now, this must be the, the smoke. I think it was on the order of about 60 different projects, something, something around there. Um, anyway, he was looking at, um, uh, riparian restoration. So not exactly wetland, but related to wetland, but he was looking at stream restoration in Orange County. Now these were all, pro so he didn't do any of these projects. So he came to them after they were all done. He essentially went to the file cabinet in the Army Corps office in Orange County, and he opened the file cabinet and he said, hey, what are the projects that we've, we've given the green light to in the last, you know, many years? So he pulled them out. He said, "Okay, here are these projects," um, and he went through them. And this is what we went, this is what he found. So I'm going from the left to the right. I'm going from the simplistic to the more sophisticated. Okay, and we're and the axis there is just from from none to 100%. Uh, okay, the first column here is planned mitigation. Now um, we haven't talked about this yet. Um, it was in maybe a little bit of our readings, but but. Uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, a restoration, you and I could get together, we could raise some money, we can get some money from Bezos, we would never get money from Bezos, but, but whatever, we get some money from somebody, some donor, and we could say, hey, let's go fix this restoration, let's go do this restoration, and that would be called a restoration. If instead, we have had a specific impact on a restoration, or, or, or we're planning on having an impact, let's say, we were expanding the 101 freeway and the width of the freeway was gonna, was gonna cut into some, some wetland on the, on the periphery of the uh, freeway, um, we would have to repair that. And this gets into federal policy and we'll talk about this when we start talking about more specifically wetlands. But um, suffice it to say, if we mess with a wetland, we have to make more of that wetland. And so that making more when we've had an impact is mitigating the impact. So that, that is mitigating the bad stuff, mitigating the bad impact. So these were all mitigations. These were all activities that impacted a riparian corridor. And so the, the home builder, the, the agency, whoever said, um, we're not allowed to do, to do that impact until they reached an agreement with the Army Corps of Engineers, the party doing the impact, the regulatory agency came together and said, both agreed and said, okay, this is what we will, this is what we agree we have that has to be done. Okay, cool. And so, so therefore, if we look on the left, 100% of the projects had a mitigation plan. So 100% of the projects had a, a plan to restore um, uh, uh, some amount of the river, right? Or the river bank. Okay, now we're going to shift. And again, uh, just for uh, uh, clarity, green is totally met all the standards. Green is, a, you know, 100% success, total success. Purple in my graph here is kind of, and typically what that means is we might have, say, multiple metrics, and some of them are met, and some of them are not met. So that would be considered a partial success. 
It could also mean if, uh, although I don't think this typically happened in this case, but, but um, if we had a single metric, partials, and let's say, say we had to get 100% native cover, partial success could be we got 90% cover or something, right? Which is clearly an improvement, but it wasn't, wasn't that we, did, we didn't hit the target we were going for. Okay, so green success, uh, sorry, green stippled success, a purple partial success, red clear failure no question did not achieve the, the the stated goals or even come vaguely close to getting the stated goals okay so the first column plan mitigation boom 100 percent of these projects had plan mitigation let's jump into the next column the permit conditions these were what both the 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 entity doing the impact and also the restoration and the agency all agreed immediately what we see is that green bar drops drops to a, a, a bit higher than half. So, so okay, uh, this, was just, this was just in the, in the records, right? <laughs> this was sitting at his desk in the office, right? These folks were legally required to do X. Did they do X? And only about half of them did. And, and perhaps more disturbingly, um, more than 10%, I think it was something around 16, 17% of the projects didn't even, didn't even try to do their permit conditions, right? Didn't even try. In places where we work in Louisiana, this bar would be about, um, the red on, on this bar would be about 80, 85, 90%. So this speaks to something that we're well, we'll touch on in this class, but it's not really the purview of this class. This is enforcement. This is legal enforcement. This is um, a, a binding legal contract that you are committed to follow and people are not following it. Enforcement is always an issue when we come to any environmental regulation, right? Um, and we're seeing that right now with COVID, right? We go, so we're supposed to wear masks when we go out and about. Uh, and, and people, sheriffs, entities in places like Orange County and other entities famously have said things like, I'm not going to enforce that law, right? So if, if um, I'm not arguing for a police state or anything like that, but, but if we have a, a regulation, a law, it's probably worth enforcing. If it's not worth enforcing, why do we have that, why do we have that law? It should just be a suggestion or something of that nature. In this case, People were allowed to destroy the environment with the agreement that they would fix it. And, and this points to people not even trying because they know there's so little enforcement and so few um, inspectors and folks like that on the ground that will you know, track them down or whatever, um, that it's, it's a huge problem. So, so that, that's a significant problem, but not the major focus of our class. Now let's move to the third column here. It's one that says qualitative evaluation. Okay. What was qualitative evaluation? Mark got in his pickup truck. I think he had a pickup truck back then. I'm pretty sure he did. He didn't have kids back then. And now he has a minivan and stuff, but, but, but uh, or he used to. His kids are older now. But anyway, I digress. So he got in his truck and he drove to these sites, each of these sites, parked the truck, literally walked out of the truck and looked at the, at the, the riparian area. That's it. He just said, does this vaguely look like a riparian uh, 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 corridor? Didn't, didn't look at the species, didn't see if they're invasive, didn't see the percent cover of you know, whatever, didn't see if they're predators. He just said, didn't look at the hydrological function, just said, hey, is this, does this vaguely look like something? And he's a very generous definition. Does this vaguely look like the thing it was supposed to be? And some of, these, some of these projects had been done relatively recently, but some of them had been done years and years previously, right? So it wasn't just that this had just been planted or just been mm, manipulated, <clears throat> excuse me, and hadn't had time to mature or, or, or do its due. This was, this was bad. Okay, so what do you find? So we found only about one in five projects met even that very generous definition of success. A large chunk of them, in purple here, as you can see, a large chunk of them, uh, about half, um, uh, were kind of, I guess it's sort of, parts of it kind of look like a river corridor, 
and then um, you know about eighty five percent or excuse me not eighty five about uh, a twenty five percent of these projects were a clear failure. You went out and it was there were no there was no trees, there were no critters, the water wasn't flowing through. it was just a dead zone, right Okay, then if we look on the right uh, most column, this is a HGM. This is one um, uh, approach um, that's become very popular in recent years, particularly for flowing water systems like, like rivers, um, natural rivers. <clears throat> this is called a high, and it works for other wetlands as well, or, or there's different, different versions of it for other wetlands. This is called a hydrogeomorphic evaluation. This was, this was um, uh, 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 piloted by some academics, but really um, was birthed in the Army Corps of Engineers and is really sort of an engineering type approach to looking at wetland functioning. It looks, um, it really focuses heavily on um, uh, hydrogeomorphology. So the stuff that Dr. Patch studies, the stuff that um, Dr. Fairfax studies. And so in, it doesn't matter what the specifics of that, of that tool is, it just means it's a specific tool that looks at multiple things and looks at them rigorously. And what you find is there is no success when you apply, when Mark applied the HGM evaluation to all of these projects. There's a handful that kind of do okay, that get a partial success, but the vast, 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 vast majority of these projects are not, were not functioning um, like the systems they were meant to replace. So the take home here is as we go from the, the most generous definition of did this restoration work to, to more, more robust or more um, uh, realistic assessments of success, we see that the projects on average don't do as well and on average are not meeting the, the desired goal. Does that make sense? Any questions about that one? Do you have any idea how many sites he checked for this? He checked all of them. It, like I said, it was on the order of about 60 or so. I, I, don't, I don't remember the exact number. Okay, that's right. It wasn't right. just Thank like you. five or six or something. It was, it was, there were several, many, dozens and dozens. Uh, and we see the same thing everywhere we've, pretty much everywhere we've looked. So here's, uh, I, I won't show uh, lots of examples, I'll just show this one other one, but this is an example from wetlands in South Florida. Um, and again, uh, this is uh, using um, uh, different definitions, right? So fully successful is in green, all the way down to, to failed or the restoration wasn't even done. Um, and what you see is we have a relatively small amount of the total data set um, that would be considered successful and a much larger chunk of them are, are partially successful. So this is telling us that we, um, while um, usually if we do it, if we actually enact the, the restoration, it's better than leaving it as a Walmart parking lot. But we are still learning the science of restoration. We're still figuring out how to make um, this, these systems recover fully. Didn't you say last time that it's a matter of how you manage it after you put it in, that you keep going back to it again and again and keep it, keep it up? Absolutely. And the whole semester, we're going to talk about all different aspects of things that will, will influence. So that's an, that, that's an super important one, Loretta. That, that's really, really key. Um, but but, but as, as Mark's stuff showed, um, it's more than just that, right? I mean, there's multiple dimensions. So, so I was speaking of a, of a well-intentioned, honestly implemented, um, you know, well-financed restoration that even after we do that, we need to do what we mentioned. We need to come back and make sure that we're, we're checking on it and, and, and nudging it where we need to, right? Um, this data suggests that um, people aren't even getting to that stage oftentimes, right? They're not even getting to the stage where they've, they've rigorously put the trees in, they've rigorously changed the flow of the water. Um, they're just, in many cases, not even trying. Okay, so, but why? Why is that? Um, and let's talk about that, or, or what's one of the reasons why. Um, so again, I just said this, but the closer, more rigorously we look, the more poorly restorations perform on average. Um, 
now, I, I, as before I go on, let me say, <laughs> and this applies to all the stuff we'll talk about in this class, I am not at attacking um, the field of restoration. I'm not saying everybody's an idiot and people are stupid or anything like that. Um, um, many of the science classes that you guys take with me or Dr. Patch or Dr. Reinemann or whatever, um, you know, fisheries management, uh, monitoring beaches with drones, uh, 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 you know, whatever it is, um, we're coming at this from an, with an academic perspective. And I'm a nerdy academic, right? I'm a professor. And so, so a lot, and in fact, the, the exercise we're going to do later on in, <laughs> this morning is, is, is a bit of that same kind of academic ex exercise. Um, we have very particular ways that we go about learning, peer review, um, um, open, open sharing of data, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and, you know, I'm paid, I'm paid to be a professor dude, right? If I do a restoration, that's cool. That's over on, I'm not, I'm, the university doesn't pay me to do a restoration. So if I do a restoration, I'm going to do that on my own time with you guys in a class. I'm going to do that with an external grant, right? Something of that nature. It's going to be in addition to my normal activities. That is not who does most restorations. Very, very, very few academics do ecological restoration. Almost all of restoration is done by folks in the consulting world, they're, they're, they're um, consultants. And so um, they're under a very different, um, actually, let me, I'll put a pin in this conversation, but I'll just say that, that the folks that are doing restorations are under a very different set of constraints than I am or, or other professors are. And they have to get a contract three months from now to do another project and a contract to do a another project and then you know three months after that and, and on and on so that's the world that they live in different from the luxury that i have of like i could do a restoration and think about it and then it didn't work and i go oh man that sucks let me go back and fix it um and you know i could spend 20 years on say a single restoration most consultants don't have that luxury and a lot of this stuff comes from this world that has evolved with quick turnaround times and they don't have the luxury of, of additional resources. They don't have the luxury of studying the system for a long period of time. It's very much sort of get in, get out, at least historically has been that way. So that's a big um, part of this background story. Okay, um, so we'll put a pin in that. We'll talk more about that later. But um, next we're getting to, so that, that Hobbes and Norton was that, uh, I mentioned was the sort of first takeaway key figure from our intro to restoration. This is number two. This is, this is the number two takeaway. So this is building on that same idea, building on the idea of Hobbes and Norton. Um, again, on the x-axis, I have age or, or time since restoration, if you want to use that. And then on the y-axis, ecological function, same axes as um, in the Hobbes and Norton um, uh, setting. But I've changed it a little bit now. So now we're talking about how we're going to assess, how we're going to measure the health or the condition of our restoration. Um, so here's our restoration, our, re our restoration, man, the, the, the yellow end of the world sun is in my eyes. So I, I hope you guys can see my cursor burbling here, but so, so here's our restoration. Our restoration is starting down here to be really, really helpful. This is the framework that we'd like to have for all the metrics. So those metrics that you guys proposed a, a, a few minutes ago, this is what I would really like this is the litmus test. Let me say it that way. This is the litmus test to see if that metric um, will be useful or not for us in our restoration. Okay, so first, uh, here is our reference condition, this top green line. Now, things bounce around. There's always natural variation. Maybe it rains a lot this year. Maybe it doesn't rain as much next year. Uh, maybe the, the, uh, the scrub jays have a really productive year in terms of laying eggs. Maybe not so productive next year. So there's always variation and that, that's a reality. That's the world we live in. So that's okay. But so, so the green line up here, it's sort of bouncing up and down a little bit, but it's, it's generally a high, it's, it's a high value, right? Okay, that's one. Two, here's our degraded state restoration. So we're down here. 
a screwed up restoration, a failed restoration would start low here, say this pink line would start low and stay low, right? It, it, it wouldn't really get much more functioning than it had originally. A successful restoration isn't necessarily, despite what everybody thinks in the sort of Hollywood version of stuff, everybody thinks that we start low and then instantly on day one, we jump up to the ideal condition. And generally speaking, that's not how it works in our systems. We're gonna, we're gonna do some stuff, put some factors in play, uh, get some stuff going, but it might, if, for example, if we're talking about vegetative cover, it might take some time for those, the plant canopy to expand to, to get to the, the level of cover that we would like it to be. Okay, so, so we're starting low and a, a successful restoration would be going up, right? And over time would eventually become indistinguishable from the reference site. Cool. So there's two things here that I would suggest to you um, and then we'll probably take our, 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 our 10 minute stretch break. But the two things that I would like all of us to use for our criteria for, and not just us, but everybody to use for a metric is these two things. One, the green needs to be statistically significantly different from the pink. So the reference condition, we have to be able to prove rigorously statistically that the, rest, that the reference condition, the target that we're going to, is higher than our current condition. If, you, if, if things are so variable, and many, many things are, many things are really, really variable. If things are so variable that we can't distinguish those two things, that is not a useful metric for our wetland restoration. That's number one. So number one, we have to be able to distinguish green from pink. Number two, to be really, really useful, and in today's day and age, I would, I would say this, this used to be something I'd say it would be great if we could do this, because of the scale of the challenges we're facing right now, I would say this is a requirement in, in my opinion, my professional assessment. And that is, see this orange line here, this orange recovery line? Not only are we able to distinguish statistically the orange from the pink, so we know, ah, we are, we are statistically, yeah, we're not, we're not to green level yet, right? We're not to that level, but we're better than pink. Right, so we're not perfect, but we're, we're, we're on a trajectory to get better. And if we can get a couple time points measured here, a couple time points on this orange, we can measure the recovery trajectory. You guys get me? We can measure the slope of this orange line. Then we can say, yes, the, the birds haven't recovered, but it looks like if we stay on this trajectory in about seven years, the birds will have recovered. And so that allows us to know early on the question that Loretta asked a bit ago, or excuse me, not allows us to know, allows us to intervene earlier. So Loretta referenced this notion of adaptive management, which is key. If all we have, if, if, if there's so much noise in the system and all we can say is, is it green or is it pink? We don't know if, if we don't know, we don't know the slope of this recovery trajectory. Is, is the wetland on track to get better in two years or is it on track to get better in 25 years, right? And that matters because maybe this is habitat for an endangered species, right? Maybe this is, this is, this is a place where this endangered species needs to get food, needs to get shelter, something of that nature. It ain't gonna work to wait 25 years. That bird or that species cannot hang out for 25 years. So if we discovered that it was going to take 25 years, that would be an instance when we would maybe want to come in and do some adaptive management. We would want to come in and tweak things, right? We want to adjust. But in the real world that we live in, we tend to have small windows of action. So for example, if, if, if we did just, if we, you and I just did the construction, we just did that and we, maybe we have money to monitor for two years, right? So that means we have the permits. You have the permits to walk in the wetland. I have the permits to walk where there's an endangered plant or something, right? And the agencies are, are supporting us, right? And maybe the, the home builder that, that destroyed the wetland that's building the houses, that home builder hasn't, hasn't been signed off yet. The Army Corps hasn't said you're good to go, right? So we're still in the sphere of we can do stuff. And then we discover that the slope of this is gonna take 25 years to recover, I can go into their offices and go, hey dude, really sorry, 
but you need to give me another $500,000 and we need to go and, and, and do some more manipulation. I need to bend this curve from the 25 year trajectory to the two year trajectory. It's at least theoretically possible if we have a metric, an indicator that's on this orange line or the, you get what I'm saying? If we don't have that, and oftentimes we don't, then we don't really understand that it completely failed until five or six years out, or we don't understand it's gonna take a hundred years as in some projects where the soil would become functionally equivalent to the thing that we destroyed. So, um, so it's about time for us to take our, our break now, our 10 minute break, but let me just say, so to summarize, this is our ideal um, um, conceptual model for an ideal metric to use to assess a restoration, okay? So we have, we have being able to distinguish reference conditions from degraded and hopefully sensitive enough that the variance low enough that we can actually distinguish a, a recovering trajectory from either of those reference or degraded states so that we could then extrapolate the recovery time for when we think we get to functional equivalence or, or full success. Does that make sense? I'm gonna show an example when we come back from our break, but, but any questions about that so far? I have a question. Yeah. It uh, might be kind of stupid because I realized you said for the reference site, there's, it has to be like statistically significant. Is it the same for the failed restorations? Like, is there a threshold to which someone oh. could say like, oh, it's not, it's not functional? Oh, I, I got you. So you mean, so, so like if we, if we, maybe if we weren't at this bottom of the curve, but we started off at some like intermediary level and you're asking, is there any way we could distinguish if it goes lower? Is that what you're asking, Dana? No, I just wanted to know if the, um, like if the failed restoration of that pink line, is, is that like statistically significant in itself or does it just vary um, for each ecosystem? It'll vary for each ecosystem. Okay. And, 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 and so I, I always use the, the, the straw man of, of a Walmart parking lot that's all pure concrete because that's just obvious. It's like obviously there's no plants or whatever. Not all of our sites are a Walmart parking lot, right? So it might be a, a field, right? off off of a road and so it's totally screwed up but there are a few plants you know there there is a frog or two here or there whereas in but it but it's clearly not a a, 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 fu a fully well-functioning wetland we could go to another site that might have frogs but the healthy system had thousands of frogs and it maybe has dozens of frogs so there isn't one level that we would just say absolutely it's totally failed unless there were literally um you know, no animals at all, no plants at all, no water at all, something like that. So, okay. so really it's about, and again, and, and this will become apparent as we get into the semester, but what you're asking is actually a really key question. That is, how do we know something has failed, right? So that, that's the same exact question is how do we know, in other words, you're asking, what's the pink line? And another way to say it is, what's the green line? there are no textbooks of this, right? So this is not physics. This is not, um, this is not fishery science where people have been studying this for hundreds and hundreds of years. Really the science of wetland restoration, which is the most advanced of any type of ecological restoration, wetland science is the most advanced, I would argue, really started, started in the 70s and didn't really get going to the 80s. So we've only had 20, 30 years to work on this. So we don't have any universal definitions the other issue is, unlike some of these more basic or quote unquote pure sciences, the, the, the goalpost is constantly changing, right? We, do, we have all this, this effing smoke in the air right now, right? So if you're a, 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 a critter or an ecosystem that relies on healthy, clean air, oh my God, you're, you're screwed, right? This is becoming more of the normal. And so, so what the reference condition was 75 years ago or 100 years ago, may or may not be useful for us now. So as we'll get into, whenever we do a restoration, I think in our heads we want to say the theoretical, you know, the theoretical um, uh, 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 bird level of performance or the abundance of birds or the theoretical um, amount of nutrients in the water, right? And in some cases we can do that. Usually what we're going to have to do is find some reference site. And so that might not be the most ideal, you know, it might not be what John Muir saw when, when he walked through wetlands or what Rachel Carson saw when she walked through wetlands. 
um, or the Shumash saw when they walked through wetlands. But it's sort of the best we have going right now, giving, given the, the setting. And so that, that'll, be, that'll become more, more apparent later when we talk about these specific subjects, but it's, a, it's an excellent point. And the answer is there is no just pure perfect answer that this is absolutely screwed and this is absolutely awesome. That we just don't have that. Okay, got it. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions about that before we take a break? Okay. Um, I'm going to start my timer. We'll take a 10 minute break. I'll pause the recording and I will see everybody back here in 10 minutes and we'll go over an example of what we just were talking about. Cool. Thanks you guys. <laughs> Okay, everybody. Let me get this back up here. All right, how are we doing on time? Oh, still have another minute or so. Any questions while we're waiting or anybody wondering anything as we're just hanging out for another minute? Hope everybody stretched properly. Hope everybody downward dogged and ate your cliff bars and all that good stuff. Okay, got about 30 seconds. I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay. All right, so uh, let's, let's get back into it, you guys. Again, everybody interrupt me if you guys have questions. Um, but uh, we, before our break, we were talking about this way to conceptualize um, uh, metrics and how and how we can go about doing rigorous assessments of our our restoration projects. Now, let's, so this is very conceptual, right? That I've that I've given you. Um, and again, this is a key figure, the Hobbes and Norton figure, this figure. But I want to put some numbers to this and show how it can actually be used in uh, in, in the real world as opposed to just theory. Okay, let's let's virtually fly over to Magoo Lagoon. Uh, now, um, uh, Magoo, I used to take everybody to, on field trips to Magoo all the time. Things got crazy uh, after 9-11 um, and security. And so it's, it's become a little bit harder, but, but um, I've done a lot of restoration here, as I mentioned before. Um, what we're looking at on the left is a tidal creek. So this is a creek that at high tides, would have water in it, it looked like a regular old creek, and then at low tides, it would look something like this or even be completely dry. So the vegetation is off on the right and left of the, of the banks. Um, this is a mud flat area. And what we're seeing there, all of the, all of the white uh, little uh, bumps or whatever, aren't, aren't uh, rocks or anything like that. They're actually a snail, a mollusk, Cerithidia californica. So I have one in, in a hand right here. And so they're little uh, horn snails is, is a common name for them. Uh, and, and they can be incredibly abundant. There can be thousands and thousands per square meter. Um, cool critter. Now, what's their natural? So, so we're, I mean, you propose that this is a great, uh, potentially useful metric to look at the functioning of a wetland ecosystem and therefore a restoration. Okay. Um, now this example is mine. So, uh, so it's gotta be great. It was totally brilliant, right? Of course, all that stuff. Um, uh, you should always feel free to criticize anything or raise any questions just because I, I did it or it's my project doesn't mean that it's perfect, even though it's awesome. But you know, other than that, you should always feel free to, to give me all your feedback. Um, uh, now, so what goes on? So this is a snail little snail right here. Um, in the, when the tide is out, they, they're, they're out and doing, now has anybody, has anybody done anything with serotidia before I start talking? Has, have any of you guys used them in any other classes or lab activities before I start blabbing? Nope. Nobody. They're a cool thing. They're also full of parasites. They're really cool, but not the kind of parasites that can hurt you, but, but uh, so that's why they're cool. Uh, okay. So 
quick natural history, because natural history is the foundation of all the stuff we do. Never forget that. Um, these are snails. They are slow moving, right? They're like, they're a snail. Well, it's just, why did I just say it? it's super stupid? Of course, this is slow, it's a snail. Um, so um, they move very slowly, right? So now if you can imagine this tidal creek, when the tides are coming in or the tides are going out, it can, there can be a pretty good clip of the water moving in there. So if you're a little snail, particularly if you're a smaller one of, of, of the size range of these guys, if you're a little one, you can just get swept away and that, would, that might be bad. So when the water is, is um, rushing, when the water is, is flowing, they will move up into the vegetation, up into the pickleweed, up into the, the vegetation where it's a matrix of, of materials, roots and rhizomes and stems and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, the water can't really drag them away. However, their food, what they're eating are diet, they're grazers. They eat diatomaceous films. They eat these, 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 this coating of single cell alga across the, the mud flat, right? And, the, and those, those algae grow best in the mud flat because that's where it's the highest sun. They get the most photosynthetic output, et cetera. So the food is all here. Refuge is all here. So they tend to move back and forth between these two um, areas in the wetland. Um, and, that, and, they, and that's what they do. They live, that, they live their life. But there's one other cool thing about them, and that is this. Uh, now, here is Cerathidia. This is the mud snail that we're talking about. They have a really cool life history that involves parasites. In this case, we're talking specifically about a trematode parasite, a little worm parasite. And um, uh, they're castrating parasites. So, wow, how crazy is that? It's already... It's 1020 and we're already talking about castration in the morning, crazy. So what happens is these parasites get inside the a snail. We'll talk about how in a second, but they get inside the snail and once the, the snail's infected, they move to the gonads of the snail and they um, essentially take over all the gonads. And um, they don't kill the snail. The snail keeps doing its life. The snail could live for years and years full, full of parasites but the snail is functionally castrated, that means evolutionarily, that individual is no longer able to produce any genes that would go into the population. So the parasites, incredibly awesome system, the parasites have gone in and they've taken over the snail. The snail's doing all the work. The snail's getting on the food, the snail's producing all the sugars and all the energy and all this and that, and they just live in the gonads and, and they, they release, the snail releases baby parasites as opposed to propagules of the snail. Okay, so, so the, the, the cyst, the, the resting stage of, we'll, we'll, so we'll start right here in my figure. We'll start with the resting stage. This is the encysted or the, um, the, the part that can stand drying, life history stage, it can stand being dried out of the trematode parasite. And these are going to be on the mud surface, right where those cerathidia are out grazing and, and getting their, their algae, right? So the snail is going to go over it with its radula, with its rasping tongue, which is how it, which is how it, it scrapes the mud and that's how it gets its food. It, when it picks up the um, algae, sometimes it gets a little bit of mud and it sometimes gets some of these metasocaria these resting stages. Now the metasocaria is goes into the digestive tract. It infects the snail. It goes through the digestive wall of the snail, and then it migrates into the gonads. Um, and, then it, and then it lives there and it produces what are called sicaria. So these are the, the swimming stages. And so then out leaking out of this um, snail are these infectious stages, actively infectious, that are looking for things to infect. Now, it depends on what, there's several, there's many species. I, I should know this, but um, I can't think. I think, I think I want to say 27 species of trematodes we've identified from Magoo, I think is what the answer is. Um, so the, so, so there's, there's, there's not just one species, there's multiple species. And so each of these trematodes species has very specific host requirements. So some require a crab like hemigrapsis or pachygrapsis, a common wetland crab. Some will infect, uh, can infect other cerathidia. Some can infect things like killifish. 
So, so they'll go into typically a fish or a crab, a fish or an invert with a cercaria. Those parasites will live inside these fish. And then um, when that fish is preyed upon by typically a bird, something like an egret, when the egret eats the fish, now the parasite go, completes the next stage in its life history. And that's the one that produces that when the, when the bird poops out, it's going to poop out the metasucaria, poop out the resting stage. And because these birds tend to hang out in the salt marsh, all these things are, are these are all salt marsh critters. Um, it's, it's most likely going to poop in an area where there might be some serifidia. So we have um, a, a, a life history, right? Now we could, you and I could go out and we could count all the birds, which is a cool thing to do. You and I could go out and count all the fish, which is a cool thing to do, or all the crabs, which is a cool thing to do, uh, or all the serifidia, right? But if we actually look at the parasites inside the serifidia, for those parasites to be present, we have to have the, so, so the, um, in, the, in the parlance of the, the parasite folks, the bird is the primary host. The bird is the, is the quote unquote main place where it lives, although it lives in all these things, but, but that's where we start the cycle. It goes into its first intermedi intermediary host, which is a serifidia. Second is, is a fish or crab typically. And so we have this, this cool life history. If any one of these elements is missing, right, the parasites aren't going to be able to complete their life history. So if we have abundant, diverse, meaning different hosts and things of that nature, and numerous, meaning lots of individuals, that means that we must have a lot of birds in the system. We must have a lot of fish in the system. We must have a lot of crabs in the system, even though we're just looking at the serifidia. Does that make sense? So let me show you what our data look like. Okay, so here's some restorations that I did. So again, of course, it must be great, must be great. So green is uh, uh, a, a, a reference condition. So getting back to Dana's question from before the break, this would be um, the area that we're trying to replicate or the, or the function that we would like to see happen in our restoration. So we have a, a, a reference site or a healthy marsh, we could call it a healthy marsh. And then the orange symbols are a restoration. And in this case, I'm showing you data from two different um, sites, the main uh, a restoration in the main part of Magoo Lagoon, and then one in an area called L Avenue, an area out towards Ormond. And so here we go. So what I'm using now, again, we showed before, what our metric should be is time on the x-axis and function on the y-axis. In this case, I'm using species richness of parasites as my measure of function. So in other words, more diversity um, uh, this means the system can support more diversity, so biodiversity support. And, and, and time is in years since we completed the construction. Um, okay, so here we go. So for each of these values, I have a mean and standard error. So I have a, a, a measure of central tendency and the variation around it, okay? So what we see is, first for us, let's just look at the green. So the green, Boop, 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 boop. The green is pretty high, right? So the green is a high level. The green is pretty much always between about, on average, about seven to, to eight and a half or so species in, in an average snail in these sites. We start out the restorations, both restorations. When we started them out, there were no snails because the restoration didn't even have snails in them at all. So there is data here, but it, it's, it's non existent, right? So we had no individuals to complete the life history. But after about a year and a half, we first saw the snails show up and we were actually able, actually they happened before then, but we were just doing it once a year. So this was the next time we were able to, to sample it. Um, and we also, I should say, we also have size, we have size um, uh, criteria for how we do this, this protocol. This was developed by, by um, Kevin Lafferty and uh, some friends up at UCSB when I was, when I was an undergrad up there. Um, and so they've developed these criteria and so they, even if it's, if it's a little teeny tiny snail, it's too hard to logistically work with. So we have, we have some criteria. So there were snails before here, but there weren't snails of the right size that would support the parasites. Anyway, okay, so here we go. So now check out this, this, first, this first iteration that we looked at. So here we go, this is, there's about eight in the reference and there's only about four and a half or five in the restoration. So we would say that, again, getting to the point of, of, of Dana's question, um, it's better than zero, right? It's better than what we started with. 
but it's not equivalent yet. So, but we seem to be on a good trajectory. And by year two, in both L Avenue and in our, in our central basin area, in that by year, by year two, we've reached what we would call functional equivalency. So there, there appears to be no difference in the functioning of, tremisode, of, of trematode parasite diversity in the restoration relative to the reference site. And indeed, as we, as we go through time, we see that. So, so some years the, the, the green is higher than the orange, some years the orange is higher than the green, but that doesn't matter statistically. It's not significantly different. And so even though in, in some years, all of the parasites go up, so maybe it was a particular good year for whatever the crabs that support species X or something. Um, and we see this repeatedly, that as we go through time, it bumps up, it bumps down. And once we've reached a functional equivalency, it stays there. So that suggests that, that, that um, these restorations, the, the Magoo restoration and the L Avenue restoration are, uh, are a well done restoration and they're, functionally, and they're functioning as we would hope they would be. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Excellent. Everybody else that makes sense? You got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. Cool. Um, okay. So there we go. So with that said, so again, keeping this idea in mind of, of the, the high functioning and then the, uh, 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 a, a metric that's specific enough and indeed uh, hopefully robust enough that measures the, the, the function. Now, I should say just to complete this, it's not wrong to go measure the birds and the fish and, and the trematodes. It'd be great to do all that, right? In the ideal world, we would measure everything. But in the world that we live in, we have limited budgets and we have limited time, right? And so um, this is a really cool metric because one, it shows that, that it works at behaving along those theoretical guidelines that I gave you, but also check it out. You and I can go out um, and, and, and pick these up in like an hour, right? We, you and I go out low tide and maybe if we, if we, maybe some, if we're all, we are able to do some of our field trips, we go to some of these sites, maybe we can glance at least at some of these guys. I'm not going to have you guys crack open parasites in this class, but snails to count parasites, but, but, um, we can go out and in the, in what we typically do is we typically collect a hundred individuals at, a, at one site. Um, we can collect a hundred individuals in like, five minutes, right? And take them back to the lab. Now, we take them back to the lab, it does take a little bit of time and take some experts to, to, you know, be able to identify the species, which species they are in the microscope. But you can do that for an hour today, you can do that for an hour next week or whatever. Whereas if you and I were surveying the birds, we have to be there at very specific times. We have to be there for hours and hours on end because some birds come in the morning, some birds come in the afternoon, etc. If we want to do the fish, we have to bring out fish traps. We have to bring out nets. We have to do, it, it's a lot more um, time, right? It would be wonderful to do all that stuff, but by doing the Serothidia parasites, we could be looking at, at the birds the same time that we're looking at the fish, same time as we're looking at the crabs, the same time we're looking at the snails. So it's an integrative measure too. Our metrics do not have to be that sophisticated, but if we can find those more sophisticated ones, that's awesome. Because again, if, we, if this shows functional equivalency and it's a more sophisticated thing that's measuring a lot of goings on in the system, we're less likely to be tricked into thinking um, uh, inadequate performance is in fact adequate, right? So more sophisticated uh, metrics, the better. And in this case, it's actually cheaper too. Okay, so having said that, boom. I'm gonna toss you guys back into breakout rooms and. Um, shorter this time. We'll just do 10 minutes this time. And so you've all, and you're going to be in different breakout rooms. I'm going to randomly generate them again. Uh, so you've already, you've heard people, what they've said. What I want you to do is first thing, once you get in the, in the breakout rooms, go back to that poll. And um, if this works, I think it should work, uh, right? It's going to have all the stuff listed. If you now the first thing you can do, if, if this conversation has made you think of some other possible metrics that you might want to um, toss in there, by all means, you can type in a new one. But if you want to do that, do that in the first um, minute or two, you know, initially. Have some talk, then I want you guys to talk amongst yourselves about, given, given what we just talked about, 
about the ideal theoretical response metric, um, uh, which of those ones that you see on the list would be good, right? And, and which, which ones would be better than these ones? And then uh, have a conversation. And then again, as a group, you don't all individually have to do this, but, but as a group, at least one person from your group should go in and downvote or upvote different, different ones. So we can see which metrics do we really think are gonna be the best in which, and, they're, and they're all valuable. I don't, I'm not saying some, some are horrible, but, but which ones are the most useful and which ones might be the least useful on our list. Cool? So 10 minutes, go back to the poll, talk amongst yourselves and refine your thinking and, and refine your voting as to which measures uh, would be good. And so I'm gonna do 10 minutes. I'm gonna, once I toss you in the rooms, I'll start, my, I'll start my timer and we will go from there. All right, you guys, see you back in 10 minutes. Michaela's back, first one back. Okay, guys. Um, I think I think everybody's back. Is everybody back? Yes, everybody's back. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, thanks, you guys. Uh, uh, did you, I saw people were still adding. Do you guys need another minute or two, or is ten minutes about good? No, it was good. Okay, that's fine. Cool. I right, get. All right, awesome. So, um, yeah, cool. So let's have a quick look at, uh, I mean, you guys may well have already looked at this yourselves, but I'll just, uh, if everybody can see my screen, I'll just show you what we have going on. So it looks like you guys definitely felt that, um, oops, there we go. Number one was, or, or the, the, the metric you guys were most interested in would be um, uh, water quality parameters. So, so dissolved uh, oxygen and nitrogen. Um, which are which are key things. Those are good. Um, very close to that is the amount of wetland dependent vegetation. Cool. Then we have um, a, a, a functional assessment. So so the I would say the the um, water and the vegetation are cool. Those are more what we'll mention in a second. They're more structure based stuff. It's not, it's not good or bad. It's just that's sort of the, the, the physical snapshot of the system. Uh, number three, though, the number of migrating birds coming to the area, um, it is, it is a, um, also a structure, we're counting number of birds, but it's also specifically, you guys noted, for mating season. So that's going to get more at a function, right? That's going to get more to process reproduction. So in other words, is there reproduction happening or is are 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 there critters here that are getting ready to reproduce? So that's cool. Next is um, uh, soil values plus goby population size plus snail population size. So I like that because again, sophisticated. Uh, it, would, it would be nice if we could have all three of those separate, but but that's okay. So you guys are talking about doing multiple metrics. I was I was looking for individual ones just so we can compare them, but but it'd be great to do all those. I like that. Uh, next is um, uh, toxicity. So, so um, we can measure toxicity just by looking at gross levels of, of a contaminant and, and, and we know that that has biological uh, effects or we could do what's called a bioassay to determine that toxicology. We could um, take a model organism, expose that water, expose that, that sediment or what have you to critters and see how many of them die or, or change their behavior. Um, water quality again, so, so same, similar ideas. Uh, then biodiversity um, mixed with insects and water and organic matter, so soil, soil components and stuff. Okay, cool. Number of keystone species. Okay, so not just, not just uh, 
and I, I should say, so these first, this first few, there seems to be general agreement. Everybody likes those things. Now we're kind of more in the intermediary uh, stuff where, yeah, they're, they're, they're good, but they're not as good as the other ones you guys seem to think. And so that would be Keystone Species, organic content. You guys already, I think organic content was up there before too, but um, um, uh, native species relative, so the proportion of native or indigenous versus non-native or exotic species. So that's a measure of, of both the support of local, that's both, both a measure of structure in a sense, but it's also um, a good measure of how much the system has been able to resist disturbance or resist invasion. Um, so that's good. Uh, there you go, see? I like the energy, I like the energy. Uh, plankton um, and, and algal stuff, harmful algal blooms. Um, oh, more beavers. I see Dr. Fairfax has worked her way into your guys' thinking. Interesting. So yeah, so keystone species. Um, uh, um, interesting, um, the, I was just explaining to my son. My son last year took, uh, he's in high school, took uh, um, uh, AP environmental science. Um, and he, we were discussing the term keystone and I gave him the whole history of it. And that's probably a bit much to give you guys right now, but, but um, keystone is an interesting term. The Keystone paper was published uh, with an N of one, something that would never be allowed to have happened now. I could tell you the whole story later, but, but um, Keystone has really gone on to, to be a term that's, that's used by a lot of folks. And it, it sometimes is used by different folks to mean other things. It, it, it's gotten a bit watered down. I think it means important for most people now that they, they use the term important. Um, one of the terms that I suspect you guys, whoever typed that one in or voted for that one, um, a, a, I'd say a more um, applicable term in the context or more popular term in the context of restoration and conservation would be the term ecosystem engineer. So it's the same, it's basically the same idea. You guys are saying that beavers are incredibly important to the system. They're, they're disproportionately important based on their biomass. If you just look at their biomass or their numbers, you would think they'd have you know some effect, but they have a way outsized effect. And and beavers really are literally an engineer, um, and so they're 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 changing all kinds of aspects of the the physical um, environment as well. Um, so something like that would be good. Bird bird abundance, bird populations. Okay, cool. Uh, 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 snails. Okay, great. Love the snails. Um, other, other microbes and stuff, microplastics. Okay. So that maybe fit in with the toxicity sort of stressor. And now we're starting to get into the ones that people are like, yeah, it's good to know, but not as good as, as these other things. Um, uh, so rainfall, um, rainfall would probably not be a good metric. I actually would say, because, um, while it's good to know, and that's really, really important in our planning to know what can be what can be supported as far as a, a metric to measure the success of the restoration that's a thing that's beyond our control so we might want to measure um maybe how much moisture is in the plants or something of that nature um but but measuring rainfall isn't really a good metric for restoration success um and for that matter i suppose microplastics wouldn't be either unless we had had some some aspect of our system that was specifically trying to adjust the microplastics. It could just be another external force that we couldn't control. Uh, water quality is down there. Uh, oh, so that's like, it's like the Ohio University. It's the water quality. Uh, maybe that's why you guys voted it down. Professor, uh, yeah. were you looking for more specifics under that category of water quality? Because those other two are way up high about toxicity. Right. <laughs> totally, yep. Okay. Yep. Looking for specifics. I, again, and, and I, I mean, we're just starting out here. So whatever you guys put out is all good. Yeah. But, but, the, but, but um, if we were doing a restoration, we wouldn't want to say water quality, right? We would maybe say okay. water quality in the opening sentence, but then we want to say, define specifically what aspect. Same idea, okay. we wouldn't want to say biodiversity, right? We might say okay. biodiversity in the intro sentence, but then we'd say, by biodiversity, we mean species richness of the invertebrates. We mean okay. the Shannon Wiener heterogeneity measure of the plants. You know, so, so we, we want to always be as specific as possible. Um, okay, so I would say something like 
in the water quality, what we what we looked for was um, uh, CO2 or uh, nitrogen or something specific. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And 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 that's for a couple. Like, in the, yeah. So the reason for the specificity is, um, as I was saying before. Um, the initial impetus, it's like you guys, when, you, when you're writing a paper for me or something like, Dr. Ray, how many, how many pages do you have to be? And I'm like, I don't care. You're like, sweet, I'm doing a half page paper, right? Or I'm doing a one page paper, right? In my head, what I meant was, ah, oh, you can do a 10 page or 20 page paper, that, that's fine, right? But if I don't define, if I don't, if I don't um, at least give you guys some specificity, I can still give you that's some- That's pretty range. good. <laughs> But right, if I don't, if I don't, if I don't say it, you, people, some people will turn in a twenty-page paper, some will turn in a thirty-page paper, and some will turn in a half-page. And and so, um, so the same thing here. When when we're being tested, it's natural. We want, I want, we all want. Eh, don't, you know, don't just tell me, you know, what you want to know. You know, so don't 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 get, don't put the specific guide rails on me, because then, if I don't perform as well as I'd like. I could still say, oh yeah, but you know, but you didn't say that and, and it's okay, right? And so because restoration is, is such a new thing, early on, especially people are like, whoa, 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 dude, don't hold me to the standard because this is, nobody knows how to do this, right? Nobody knows how to do this. Understandable, but we are, we've, we've left that era when that should be considered acceptable. Unfortunately, it's still acceptable in a lot of places. We should not be there. We should be saying, look, the deal is you need to make 30 species of plants or, or whatever it is, right? That's what I mean by biodiversity. I want to see the richness of, of vegetation. And that needs to be at least, according to our, our re reference site, that needs to be at least 18 species to start with or something of that nature. That by having the rigorous standard, even though it's a pain in the butt and you stress out and you're gonna have to study and you have to work on that paper, you're gonna actually produce better scholarship, right? If I hold you to doing at least a 10 page paper than if you produce a half page paper, generally speaking. Maybe you're brilliant and maybe you wrote the best haiku in the world and maybe that would work. But, but by and large, um, um, having fuzzy standards, having vaguely defined things, essentially allows crap restoration to be passed off as adequate. And we can no longer afford that. So that's why we want specificity. And it turns out it's actually super helpful. It might not seem like it at first, but it's very helpful for me to tell you you have to do a 20 page paper. Because then you know what you have to work towards, right? If you have a, and I've, I've done restorations like this where there is no guideline. People are just like, oh dude, make more wetland. And it's as strange as it sounds, it's actually really stressful because a wetland, you want a purple wetland? You want a red wetland? You want a blue wetland? You want a tall wetland? You want a short wetland? And then, and then people like me tend to go down these rabbit holes of, well, we could do this and we could do that. But having clear targets really helps the design. Having clear targets really helps the implementation and having clear targets really helps the assessment of the restoration. Okay. And it would make it much easier. It does. It does. Again, it seems like it, it not when you're first taking the first step up the mountain, but actually it makes it much better for everyone. And then, and then the key thing, I'm sort of blowing the punchline here, but the key thing is, um, and I say this all the time, um, I'm totally fine if all my restorations um, crap out. I'm totally fine if all my restorations fail completely. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be fine. I'd be I'm bummed and angry, but, but, but intellectually, I'm okay with that. As long as I learned something, as long as my doing of the do showed me that there was a problem. What's unacceptable is when, um, when we uh, uh, do a restoration, don't know why it failed and then try the same thing again. And the guy, the guy in Ohio is trying the same thing again. The lady in Florida is doing the same thing again. The guy up in New York is doing the same thing, right? That is BS, right? Stakes are becoming too high. Systems are becoming too stressed for us to play at restoration, right? 
So I want everything to succeed, but what's not allowed, it's not allowed us to not improve. Every single time we do something, we always need to be getting better. Having clear metrics is a key way that we're gonna assure that we're doing better. If we have loosey-goosey metrics, we're gonna trick ourselves and think what we're doing is okay, right? It's not. We have to be adult enough to, to face the fact that maybe this, this sucked. And, and as painful as that is, that's okay. Unacceptable to stay in that level of, of suckiness, right? We need to always be improving. Okay. And then um, we're almost time for another break. Man, I'm rambling on here. Uh, uh, so nutrients, uh, uh, the amount of plants, biomass, abundance of plants. Okay, cool. Um, sedimentation, uh, again, um, um, uh, uh, the species that might be the, the most numerically dominant, water quality again, keystone species again, water length, oh, the, the old water length, I like that, that's, that's like, um, you, presumably the, the amount of water or the hydrology of the system maybe, and then measuring the S which is, I'm not sure, we're talking about species richness there or what? Yeah, um, that, that was me, but I accidentally clicked enter and I couldn't delete it. Okay, cool. Interesting. So the, yeah, so that uh, this tool, uh, uh, this tool says working better. I tried it in, was it you guys or was it Coastal? I tried it the first time and it, and it sucked. And it's because I, I ran out of, so I, I paid for a membership, my great. But now as I'm trying to edit this, the thing down here says, oh, upgrade to give more money to enable me to, to, to edit your spelling. So screw that. I'm going to allow you guys to have bad spelling and I'm not going to pay more money to these guys, but but okay, cool. But we get it, right? So, so clearly, so you, we have some, all these are valuable things to know, right? Um, but some are clearly more valuable than others. Um, I was going to go into our last section, but given that it's 11 o'clock now, I think, I think we'll take our, our next uh, 10 minute stretch. So we'll do a quick 10 minute stretch and come back and finish, uh, finish uh, this, this intro topic. Cool. So we have 10 minutes, you guys, Does everybody take a stretch, everybody stand up, move around. Um, and I will see you all in 10 minutes. Ready, set, go. Dr. A. Yo, 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 yo. Are you getting up to stretch or can I ask you a question? Yeah, no, go ahead. A ask me, go for it. No, I just, I, um, I don't know. Is there anything that you saw on that, on that poll that stood out to you as being specific enough? Because I, I feel like you gave us enough, enough time for us to like brainstorm, but I feel like I was sort of having a brain fart because I couldn't think of anything it's all good. super specific. I mean, it's all good. It's all, I mean, this was, this was, we're, we're still just starting this and you, we haven't read any papers yet or whatever. So it's, it's, I, this is totally great. I mean, for an actual metric, yeah, I'd want it more specific than this. You know, I, water quality yeah. wouldn't cut it. We need to be specific. But for today's exercise, this is great. This is, this is, no, don't stress about it. This is good. How long does it usually take for um, like a restoration ecologist to come up with something super specific that, that they think is going to work? How long? Like, what's oh, the time that's a line? great question. And the answer is going to be, the answer is as much time as they have. So I'm on the <sighs> advisory group. I'm on the advisory, like one of these, I'm on these state panels that all the old farts sit on and, and, you know, provide guidance and stuff. And so some of those, like the Ormond Beach Task Force, no, oh, sorry, not Ormond Beach Task Force, the Ormond Beach Restoration Science Advisory Committee or whatever the hell it's called. Um, I've been on that. Yeah, let's see. Probably, well, the current iteration for probably 12 years. Um, uh, on some form of that for about 15 years. Um, and that one is a bit complicated because we don't have the money to do stuff. So we keep sort of doing pilot studies, initial studies. But um, I would say it's, and we'll get into this later in the semester, it really is going to depend on how much information is available. In places like Turkey where I work, there's just no data at all. So essentially every, all the background, like how much does it rain here? Uh, uh, what kind of insects are in the pond? We have to do that all ourselves. There, there just is no reference. Um, I mean, there's, there's no papers to read. There's no, there's no journals to look at. So it's all us. Then I'd say there's places like, um, like Louisiana, which would be, which are definitely not Turkey, but they're also not California. Um, so there's, there's stuff going on, but there's an, for as big a place as that is, a biggest state as, as that is, and as, as, 
as big a challenge as, as they face in terms of their wetland loss. Um, uh, it, there's, there's, there's an amazingly few number of people actually doing the restorations. And indeed, when we hire people for our projects to do things like herbicide application that take care of some of the invasives, those people oftentimes come from outside the state. So, so that's sort of, you know, that's not, not turkey length, but that's not California length. And you have a place like California where there's lots of people doing lots of projects. And so there's both formal networks and informal networks of getting, of getting um, information and, and all this and that. Um, and so I'd say it completely varies. I would say if, if you sort of held a gun to my head or something and said, design this restoration this week, um, for a salt marsh in Ventura County or something like that, I could, I could, I could put something together. It would, be, it would be good. It wouldn't be maybe the best in the world, but it would be pretty good. But if you did the same thing and said, um, design a restoration for me for this wetland pond in, in, in Eastern Oregon that just burned, I, I would need more time. And probably everybody would need more time because there aren't that many restoration projects and in those systems in Eastern Oregon. But I would say reasonable would be, you know, uh, uh, several f f site visits. So, so where you can go out initially and just sort of look at the place, you know, just sort of walk around and kick the dirt and just kind of get the gestalt of stuff. And then, um, and then several visits where you went and actually collected some data and actually measured, you know, uh, quantitatively measured the plants, measured the critters, measured the water, that kind of stuff. And so um, that would be ideal. And so you'd have your, so I have my theoretical understanding of what I would do, but then I want to go out and ground truth it, make sure that, that this really makes sense here, that this endangered tiger beetle that I thought lived here actually does live here, that kind of stuff. And so I would say ideally it would be a couple months. You know, I think, I think in a place like Ventura County, if we had a couple months, I think that's, that's enough time. If it's a place like Turkey, it's probably you need at least you know a year or two to figure out what you should do. Does that help? Just because of the lack of data that that is going to be um, available, yes. or both lack of data and just because no one has done anything out there before, and or, yeah. or well, well I, I have, we have, my colleagues and I have, but but there's <laughs> just, it's just there's there's no there's very little history there. So I, so again, this is this is both a, a, a sort of accumulated knowledge and knowledge on the ground it's both of them and like when i go to turkey and i do stuff there's just no there's no plant guide and so i have to use plant guides from other parts of well where i work is technically in asia but i have to use a plant guide from europe kind of thing right as mm -hmm. as the thing and so it's it's always a little bit like that's probably that grass but i'm not a taxonomist right so i i'm not a grass expert and so yeah. I, I could i mean if i had all the time in the world I could snip it and send it to whoever and wait for nine months or a year for him or her to tell me that it's actually species, blah, blah, blah. But in a practical sense, that's just not really, that's not that, that realistic a way to handle stuff. I mean, that, that's, that's a wonderful research project. Or if we were doing a, a UN World Heritage Park or something, maybe we would do that. But for doing restoration, we just usually don't have the time. And again, a lot of times it's because there is already a stressor that's happened, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's the house that's going in, the freeway that's going in, and they're just like, F that, we're putting, we got to put the freeway in, right? People are dying because of the traffic or something. And yeah. so we've got to do this. And so, so a lot of times the, the real world constraints are going to dictate how much time we have. But again, in an ideal world, it's enough time that you would be ideally familiar with the system in general and then have the opportunity to make an initial inspection, and then several preliminary sites to refine your, your thinking. Got it. Okay. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. How are we doing on time? We got about three minutes. All right. I'm going to go get some a drink real quick. And I'll be right.
Hey guys, you got about one more minute. Let me just uh, call this up here. I think I'm still recording. Okay, about 30 seconds. Okay, while we're waiting, I'm just gonna, um, you guys don't click on these links yet. This is just for our next activity, but just since I have a couple of seconds here, I'm just gonna put this in the chat so that so they exist for everybody. Okay. All right. I think we're time now. So let's get back going. Okay, everybody. So welcome back. Um, hope everybody had a good stretch. So um, we're going we're gonna to finish up now with this last little bit of a sort of conceptual introduction to restoration. And, and I just want to um, note some of the um, assumptions that, that are, are big. Can you guys, before, we, before I, I throw a couple of ones that I, I think are important, you guys want to toss out any um, restoration assumptions, either in the chat or out loud? Uh, or assumptions, so let me, let me be clear. So assumptions that you think are commonly made by people doing restoration projects. Again, this is like the metrics. We're just getting into it. We haven't read a lot of papers yet. So I know you guys are, are, are just scratching the surface here, but, but maybe you could think of some ideas that might, you think people might be making assumptions when they do a restoration. Once they've started a restoration, the system will take over and finish it on its own. Yep, totally. Yep, absolutely. Um, can we can we discuss it like from an outsider's perspective, like someone that thinks, oh, they're gonna do this restoration and it's gonna it's gonna be successful? You know what I mean? Like they're just gonna assume that it's gonna work. Sure, sure. I mean, managing expectations are totally is yeah. an important thing as well, right? Yeah. We we start talking about sort of uh, like the larger scale restorations in places like um, the Everglades and stuff. That'll become a huge factor and, and people think that up oh, it's done you know it's like very similar to uh you know electing president obama up oh, racism done mm, check you know that kind of thing what else other ideas other other assumptions you guys are thinking about i think people think that just like the presence of trees or the presence of plants just being there means that the place is restored if it didn't have it before but that really is no indication of function or what's actually going on in the area. Totally. So we have some water here, so that must be a healthy lake. We have some 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 tall trees here, so that must be a healthy forest kind of thing. Yep, totally, totally. Other ideas or other thoughts? Uh, just a couple that are in the comments right now, Dr. Anderson. Um, Angel said it, that like uh, it's dirty slash messy, and Dana said, "How about politics being in favor of all projects?" Ooh, wait, Dana, I don't, I don't explain that. What you mean by that? How about? I'm so sorry. I know I typed it, and <laughs> Chris, you read it out loud. I'm like, damn it, that was not what I meant. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, in terms of getting like political entities, you know, to be in favor of a project. I mean, I feel like there's got to be a lot of tension, you know, with private citizens, you know what I mean? Like there's a, there's a lot that goes into play when it comes to the politics of a project. Yes. I totally. And I, okay. and I, I don't, this is later on in the semester, but I've been trying to figure out what a cool activity would be to do around this exact topic. But I'll just say really quickly that um, if we're talking about restoring the Everglades, if we're talking about restoring, uh, uh, San Francisco Bay, if we're talking about restoring Southern Louisiana, these big systems. Um, uh, we go to Congress and say, Congress need a billion dollars to do this. Congress doesn't want to hear that I want to build, if, what I just told you guys before, oh, I'm totally fine if all my restorations crap out, right? As long as we learn something, right? if I went and said that to Congress, they're not going to give me a billion dollars, right? They're not going to give me a billion dollars to an experiment. If I say, you give me a billion dollars and I will make more Everglades, 
yep, uh-huh, totally. You should give it to me, right? And, and part of that is, is silly, but part of that is totally understandable, right? I mean, I mean, we have limited resources. Is, this, is it really worth putting our resources into something that we're not sure is, or don't have a high confidence it's gonna work out exactly like we outline? So some of that is, is, is the practitioner's fault of overselling it, but in some cases they kind of have to oversell it, I, I, I would say to an extent. But it's also about educating our elected leaders in this whole idea of restoration and, and conservation stuff in general. But right, saying that we're gonna stumble, right? We don't know how to save the grizzly bear perfectly, right? We're gonna try some stuff and it's gonna be messy and there's gonna be some things that will fall down on, but we'll keep making progress. We need to make sure that our, our leaders understand that. And, it, and the assumption that everything's gonna be perfect and, and all this and that, um, from the funders or from the political world is a, is a very real biology for a, a very real barrier for a lot of aspects of ESRM. And, uh, and this is, this is just but one, but that's good. Other thoughts. Uh, that's all I see in the chat so far, but, um, but, uh, anybody else? Okay. Um, here are some of mine. Um, so there are many, many restorations, or many, 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 many assumptions, and I think we'll probably um, return to this question uh, as the semester progresses. Um, but uh, why is my screen all like this? Okay, um, but, uh, but these are, I think, some of the most important ones. One is that we, in fact, even can recreate historical conditions, not even if we should or shouldn't, but, but there's this, this hope springs eternal that we can make wetlands the way they used to be. We can make the kelp reef the way it used to be. We can make the desert the way it used to be. Um, next would be that, uh, and, and we touched on this uh, in a, just a few minutes ago, but um, the notion that just by tweaking some of the physical infrastructure, the abiotic environment, that by definition is going to support our desired organisms. Um, oftentimes it works, it totally can happen, but it's a big assumption that if we just do this, then that will happen. Um, a real big one for our wetlands is the soil in which our wetlands reside, or, or, or the soil that, that, that they're a key part of supporting the vegetation and the in fauna of our wetlands. Many, many times, wetland soils are not, you know, idealized wetland soils are not what we have to work with. And we use substandard so or, or, or soils that are of a different nature than what are needed to support the plants and animals in a wetland. And, and while this is an issue for any type of terrestrial restoration, at least, um, it, it is particularly problematic for wetlands. Uh, and then um, uh, we'll talk about this in a second, but this notion of the, the critters that we want to come will come after we just plant like the mother, the, the mother plant, the nurse plant. We'll, we'll put a couple of these plants in, then everything else will, will come along. It's called the field of dreams hypothesis. Uh, and then uh, next, simply um, uh, reestablishing natural disturbance regimes is critical to long-term stability. This, I think this is very important. Many of us think this is very important. Um, but it nevertheless is an assumption. It might be possible, for example, if we talk about fire, right? Fire is much in the news today as we look out our windows and, and all of that. Um, uh, maybe uh, ideally we'd have a return to historic fire burn intensities, historic fire return rates, for that matter, flooding rates along our, our rivers and stuff and, and, and intensity and, and, and frequency of floods. Um, but, uh, and so that, the ideal thing is nature does that, right? The ideal thing is that nature ra rises the, uh, raises the amount of water in the, in the river. Nature lightning sets off the, 
the initial spark that starts the fire that comes down into our valley. Maybe, but maybe that's something that we can deal with. Maybe we can do controlled burns at a certain frequency. Maybe we can release water from the dam at a certain frequency to mimic some of those um, uh, natural disturbance regimes. Um, and uh, so anyway, so I would say for wetlands, these are some of the most important. There are many, many more, but these are just the ones I wanted to highlight in terms of uh, things that um, uh, often go unspoken. Having an assumption is totally cool. It's, it's fine. We need to be explicit about those assumptions though. Otherwise we tend to get into problems. And that's what this next, that's what I wanna talk about next here. Okay, first is a little bit about, um, we're not talking about how we're doing the restorations yet in our class, but, but um, uh, this is um, the, the quick version. So um, this is a famous paper by this guy about 20 years ago that sort of outlined this. And so I just like to give credit where credit's due. I didn't come up with this. It, it, I was thinking this in my head, but, but this guy really sort of codified it. And so, so anyway, um, there, there's sort of two extreme approaches we can take to restoration. In reality, like most things, it's a false dichotomy. It isn't a A or B. It's really most stuff falls out in between. But in general, the approaches we can take would be a structure-based process. If we're talking about a wetland, that might be, you know, scraping the, the ground so that we create the contours of the pond and, and that kind of stuff, right? Structure first, and then the process comes next. The, the, the recruitment of plants and animals and, and flooding and that kind of stuff. Alternatively, you could have a, a restoration that started with the process first and the structure would come along later. That would be, an example of that would be say a river restoration where we had dammed the river for a hundred years and, and the water was level was just very, very constrained for a hundred years. And then we, um, we removed the dam upstream. So now we can have you know, winter floods and, and summer droughts and all this and that. So that might be the first step to doing the restoration. And then we think about later on adding some logs for woody debris and, and stuff of that nature. So you can go either way. Having said that, the vast majority of people do a mix of these, but they really tend to heavily bias much closer to the structure. So the general approach for us to, to do restoration is to, um, it tends to be very macho, tends to be very male, tends to be very spitting and swearing, and a lot of kind of like, oh, I'm driving my tractor around, and I'm, you know, like that kind of stuff is, is how we begin. And, and, so pro, and so structure comes first, we, we get the elements in place and then we um, either allow the process to come along or we try to encourage the process to come along or the ecological function. Again, I would refer to that as, as now what we might call classic restoration. So these are pictures from different restorations of mine. And, um, and the idea is that the, the, the traditional thinking on restoration is that we set the stage for ecological succession and eco in, in, in the processes to come along. So um, there's, a, there's a guy underwater here, and these are um, actually uh, uh, ceramic fake coral heads, those, those, white, those yet white star ball things. So these are, are, are baked in a kiln, and they're actually shipped flat in a, in a conix box, in a cargo box, cargo container. And then you get them and you put them together like a three-dimensional puzzle and you take a piece of rebar and you jam it in and it holds these, holds these structures in the ground. So they serve as the substrate upon which baby coral, coral polyps, planula can, can settle out of the plankton and start to colonize and grow. As you can see this area where the picture is taken, the coral reef is totally destroyed. There's, there's, there's no coral left because of whatever, because of because of anchoring, because of sedimentation. And so this would be a way of setting the stage for the coral reef restoring. Um, another one would be on the left side here. This is one of my controlled burns up in, the, up in Northern California. And so this is a grassland that's been burnt and you can see the smoke is still drifting. But so the first thing is, hey, let's get rid of all the non-native, let's get rid of the weeds as much as we can, the non-native critters. And so we've burnt this site. And then we do something like, 
like add seeds, like in, in uh, my technician's hand up here on the upper right. And these are, these are uh, native grass seeds. So, so all that is sort of, you know, I'm not planting direct plants. I'm not putting in bird nests. I'm putting in the plants, the seeds that will germinate into plants that will turn into larger plants that will be, that will serve as the material from which the birds can make their nests, that kind of idea. Um, and, and our, the most interesting of these hypotheses, I would say, and you guys have already touched on it, is, um, is the field of dreams. And so this is my son when he was little, and this is at one of my restorations up at Stanford. And so you can see the Stanford bell tower in the far right over there. And my uh, mother-in-law actually made him a, a safety vest. So he was legal as we follow all the safe field safety protocols there. Um, and so he, so obviously I'm successful because I built the restoration and he, and he came, right? So there you go. I'm, I'm another one of my fantastic restorations. Um, so this hypothesis, this notion, if you build it, they will come, is, is known as the field of dreams hypothesis. It was first published in this paper by Palmer et al. in the journal Restoration Ecology in 1997. Um, and, and, and how they phrase their, the original phrasing of the question is, is the, is the restoration of the physical habitat where the critters live enough to restore those species or enough to restore ecological functioning? That's how they phrase it. This was part of a paper on, 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 on trying to be more theoretical in, in terms of restoration. There were, there were several things in there. This was but one of them. Um, and we had a graduate seminar on this. So one of the authors is one of my professors of this paper uh, in graduate school. And um, we, had, we, we held a graduate seminar to actually start to look at this, at this, um, at this theory, at, the, at this, this assumption, this field of dreams hypothesis, this, this assumption that everybody makes, but very few people state explicitly. It's an implicit assumption. So we made this database. So I just wanna show you some of the results from the database. And then um, we'll run out of time today, but then on into next week, we're going to actually start to create our own modern version. I've, I haven't played with this database in years, and I haven't, I haven't thought about this question in years. But given that we're online, it seemed to be an interesting way for us to actually explore it again. So that, that's where I got the idea for the, this activity. So this, this is the database that we originally created. Oh, yeah. So yeah, this is, it's like Bob the Builder. Feel the Dreams, a Kevin Costner film, right? He's in the, he's in the cornfields, and he's, if you build it. Right? And I said it in a previous, uh, previous lecture. If you guys haven't seen that movie, you should watch it. Then it'll make more sense. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, we Bob the Builder. If we, if we just build it, will everything come? Okay, so let's talk about this database that I compiled. Actually, my colleagues and I compiled. We were interested in all types, and we're going to do the same thing for us. Database of any kind of wetland restoration we can find, right? So there's, we weren't restricting it to one type or another. The first iteration of the database, which is the data I'm gonna show for you, and this is gonna provide us hypotheses we can test with our own database in our, in our modern search of the literature. We got 70 peer reviewed papers and we, we quantified uh, 32 different variables about, about the wetland project itself, about what the goals of the project were, about the performance. We couldn't always do every single variable for every single study, of course, but we, as many as we could, we, we tried. Now the projects varied in age. So some were very young, some of the, well, sorry, none, I guess this, this iteration, later iteration of the database, we had more. But at this iteration of the database, uh, everything was at least a year old. So, the, so we didn't just do the construction. So some were within the last five years or so, some were um, older than five years, and then some, because of the nature of maybe there was multiple projects involved in the paper, some spanned a range of ages. In five years, you'll see five years is the reason why that's is, is not, not a magic number, but it's more of a number that just people have, have fallen out. Now that seems to be, at least in California, at least in the people in the areas of the world that care about restoration, five years has now become the minimum time for, in, in terms of writing in permits that you have to monitor the project for. It's not consistent. Many parts of the world, there still is no, no standard. Um, many parts of our country, there still is no standard, but, but that's, that's where we get the five years from. Um, okay, and then size in hectares. So some are really small. Most are more around a hec one hectare in size, um, but then uh, some are, are about a third are decently sized, you know, relatively big. And then again, some, because of the nature of looking at what's published in the paper, might be multiple size projects. 
Um, and, uh, and so we try to quantify a couple things and this wasn't always possible, but this is something I hope we can do in, in our exercise, which is uh, wetland. So, so, so we're talking about wetlands. So is this a wetland that's next to another wetland or right adjacent to another wetland, right? Which would be high, uh, it'd be very contiguous, right? Or is it sort of medium or little, or is it just totally out in the middle of nowhere? Or in some cases, you just can't tell from the paper. You can't tell where exactly it was relative to other sites. And then in terms of, and so that, that's with other wetlands. Then what about the other systems? We historically have drawn a line, and you guys have read now some of the literature on what defines a wetland. Um, uh, even though that's been very useful for those of us studying wetlands, wetlands need terrestrial and aquatic habitats and everything else. So, so, then the, so this is about wetlands. This is about the other things outside the wetlands. So the upland, the forest, the river flowing in, whatever. And that is, was this area relatively intact? Only about one in five of the projects had a, you know, were uh, say a well-functioning wetland that just had say somebody, somebody dumped some chemicals in and killed it, but all the rest of the stuff is okay. Versus, um, you know, a third of the sites were highly, highly disturbed, meaning that it was probably this wetland out on its own, surrounded by a, a housing development or something of that nature. Okay, does that make sense so far? Okay, so then we have this database, and this is what we'll do in the next week or so, is, um, is we got these papers, and then we went and we just, we just, you know, we didn't do any data collection. We didn't go to the sites. We didn't, we didn't visit them. We just said, hey, here's the paper, and we went and tried to score them. And so we said, and so by their own definitions of what they were trying to do, they're trying to recover species, they were trying to recover, you know, reproducing birds, whatever the, whatever the, the metric was. And um, many times there was more than one metric they measured. And so none of them were, or, so they're all, sorry, what am I looking at here? Okay, so acceptable, less than acceptable, or right, let's start on this side, better than acceptable. So I mean, exceed standards. So they got more frogs than they thought they would get. Acceptable means they hit their target for a successful project. Less than acceptable, means that um, they got some frogs, but it, it wasn't enough. It what didn't meet their their successful target. So you maybe call that partial success. And then unacceptable, they're just there were no frogs, you know, that kind of stuff. And so we went through and we said of the metrics were how many of them were of this category, this category, this category, and that category. So I know this is a lot, but is this making sense? Are people keeping up with me? Give me an audio yay or nay. Yay. 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 Other people okay? Yeah. Yay. Yay. Any, any, I hear from a couple other people. Yeah, making sense? Mm -hmm. Yay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, good. All right, thanks, guys. Okay, cool. All right. Yay. So, perfect. Thanks, Clay. Great. Okay, so then, um, uh, then after we've done those for all the individual studies, then we compile, then we just did the summary statistics of all of them, right? So we said, okay. Um, and, and we, we went through it and we determined this. So, so, okay, here's the answer for all the different studies, or this is a subset of all the different studies we did, where the, the restoration performed beyond expectations, hit their expectations, less than expectations, or just was an obvious fail, right? And so uh, this, this part gets a bit much, I, I won't ask you guys to do this. I'll, I'll, I'll look at the data we compiled because this gets to be a bit hard, um, or we'll at least discuss it. Um, but uh, this stuff here, where all of the metrics that we looked at were beyond acceptable, we never had a case like that, but that would be the ideal condition, right? We measured a bunch of things and everything was boom, rocking and rolling and did way better than we thought, right? That would be great. We did have a few cases though, where all of them at least hit the, the minimum target for success, all of the metrics. We also had one project in, in this initial iteration that hit many of them. Maybe not every single metric was totally successful, but many of them were. Do you guys get what I'm saying? So this, so this is um, projects that fell out in this analysis space we could consider successful. I hope you agree. Now this is a relatively strict definition. This is a conservative definition of, of success. 
that we had to at a minimum at a minimum have many of our metrics metrics be acceptable okay well we could also that might be a little bit a little bit strong so we could also come up with a more generous definition of what is what is a success or what is restoration success so here we've kept that same initial box but we've added to it and so here we're saying well it's okay if at least some of our metrics were acceptable it's at least okay if some of our metrics were you know beyond acceptable and, and, and maybe we can consider that in the more liberal definition of of uh, of success and so those are the two those are the two categories i'm going to show you now make sense so the so the brown is the strict letter of the law have to do this the orange is a little more um, perhaps realistic or a little more generous and this is what we found so here we go so if we build it did it come first we'll talk about taxa so this is these are organisms so if we look at all taxa for all the studies in our database the the first bar here the the dark is again that conservative that strict definition and then if we add the more generous definition that's the top of the light orange bar so what we see is overall around a third of the time did taxa come so if we built it two-thirds of the time they did not come right so that's a huge problem if that's our assumption and we, we haven't been explicit about it. If we're explicit about it and we say, I think my restoration will succeed, I'm assuming that if this, then that, and then da, 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 we can track back what was, what was the problem. The problem was we assumed that was gonna happen and that didn't happen. Okay, so next I've just, um, and again, this is gonna be very hard when we're looking at other people's studies, but, um, and you know, very heterogeneous, but I've, I've created different bins here of at least gross types of critters and what we see is from invertebrates and these these generally speaking aren't insects these generally speaking are actually um, aquatic invertebrates or soil invertebrates generally speaking we go from invertebrates to fish to birds to plants as we go to critters that have a greater ability to self disperse think of plant seeds blowing in the air Think of birds flying over a, a hardened landscape of a, of a suburb to get to our wetland. The, one, the, the, the taxa that could move more easily tended to come more easily, right? Those ones that were more restricted in terms of how they get around the landscape, those are less likely to come. So that tells us that if we're gonna do our restoration, we might want to do some helping hands for the inverts and the fish, right? We might want to uh, go to a site, physically pick up some of the babies or the adults and physically transport them ourselves to the site. Don't trust nature to do that. Okay, so, so with taxa, only about a third of the time did they come. And there's clear differences based on the type of, of, of organism. Functions, this is the biological going on of the systems. So all functions um, are more like about 17% of uh, those functions returned only about 17% of the time. So the taxa were much, even though they were, it was only one third of the time, nevertheless, the taxa were more likely to come back than, would, than are the functions. And that's not surprising. The functions are more sophisticated going on, right? So we could maybe have the birds here, but maybe they're not nesting. Right? We need to have a, a more well-functioning system for them to actually nest, the food for them, the, the places for them to, to, to nest and, and things of that nature. And then I've just been this by a few different broad categories. This is biological diversity, maintenance of diversity, breeding or reproduction, and then primary productivity. That is the growth of plants and, and primary producers, right? So the biomass of algae, the biomass of angiosperms, stuff of that, that nature. Secondary production would be the accumulation of biomass of, of herbivores and things that eat the plants. And so uh, long story short, this was very messy. So while there was some pattern in the taxa, wasn't really a clear pattern um, uh, observed in the functions. Uh, and then I just wanna mention the effect of size. One of the few significant things we found was uh, 
a consequence of size. And generally speaking, as you might, ex might suspect, as, we, as the restoration that we do gets larger and larger, it tends to be more likely that if we build it, stuff will come. So maybe it's because we create a big enough dartboard. So if we're throwing dart, if you imagine a bird flying across the landscape, if we made a little 100 foot by 100 foot wetland, mm, maybe the bird's not gonna see it, right? Maybe he's gonna fly right past it. But if we make a wetland that's a mile by a mile and, and this bird is flying by and she glances down, ah, you know, I, I'm much more likely to see it. So, so size, while it was a, not a super strong effect, there was an effect of size such that the larger the project, the more likely they were going to come after we built it. So the conclusions I would say from this is that um, on average, when we build stuff, things usually don't come. And, and we've seen this in other projects and other, and other sites and other, other people have tested this hypothesis. And generally speaking, just simply building it isn't enough um, to get the, the performance we would like to get. Uh, it's true, many factors influence um, recovery, like the taxon that we talked about, dispersal ability, all, many, many things. But it seems closeness to a source of, of the, the critters or, or the functioning we're trying to re, re, um, recover, the closer we are to that, the better, and the bigger the project is overall, the more likely it is for those services and those, the, the, the function to, to show up. The take home this from all this though, is that we should really, really, really work hard to make sure that our assumptions are explicit. And, um, and that will always benefit us in the long run. And it will always benefit you in the long run. Uh, okay, so does that make sense? Any questions about the field of dreams as, as a concept? Okay. Okay. So then um, for our last activity today, actually, we're getting pretty late. So let me just uh, hold on one second. We'll go back to this. So I just want to uh, just finish this up real quick and then we'll go back to our activity, um, which is um, so barriers to restoration success um, related to metrics are adaptive management on paper only. We don't have a, a large scale buy in to people actively wanting to augment and change their management of the system after we've done the initial restoration. Um, a lot of times because of that, they don't want to invest in robust metrics because we don't have an, 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 a robust adaptive management framework. People don't care as much about uh, metrics after they've passed their initial sign off stage. Naive assessment metrics like we saw from Mark's work in San Diego Naive assessment metrics are what drive poor performance. Having these low standards, not being clear, not being specific with our values allows poor performance to be considered adequate. And then that system is what we have in our environment functioning in the place of a healthy, function, a healthy system. And then lastly, as we've seen from this last example, Rarely are we explicit about our assumptions. They're almost always implicit. And the action, and this goes for anything you guys are going to do in ESRM, the more you can examine your assumptions, the better. And the more you can be explicit, the better. In the case of restoration, when we're explicit about them, they afford us the opportunity to actually go and test those assumptions. And, and again, the take home ideas from this, the, the big take home ideas from this, this whole intro to restoration concepts, uh, the, the concept of restoration is this, this Hobbes and Norton model of, of restoration and performance and starting from a de degraded state and going to that, that desired state. And then this conceptual diagram for what would make a really useful metric or assessment of our restoration, something that one, this, rigorously distinguishes between reference condition and degraded condition, and ideally a, a, a metric that's sensitive enough that we can actually distinguish intermediary stages of recovery and therefore predict recovery trajectories and estimate time to equivalency, functional equivalency. Cool. So that's all the concepts I wanted to do, but the last thing I wanted to, to get us going on and I thought we'd have more time, but I obviously talk, I like to hear myself talk apparently, 
Um, so uh, uh, this is what I wanted us to do for this week. So I wanted us to see if we could um, test the field of dreams hypothesis ourselves. Um, and so that's gonna involve uh, getting some primary literature and, and looking through the, the references. Uh, looking through those papers. You don't necessarily have to read every single paper, but you have to skim it, right? And, and see if we can glean stuff from it. Now, I'm going to put this up as a module, given the time, I'm going to put this up as a module for next week, uh, it, it, when I activate uh, this next week's um, module in uh, Canvas. But um, uh, what you guys are going to do is you're going to search the library databases for something. So we're looking for references that deal with wetland restoration. Right, and, and, and some measure, not the design of a restoration, but, but some paper that was published, peer reviewed literature, so in, a, in an academic journal, uh, not a news story or something like that. Uh, so a, a journal article about wetland restoration can be about any type of wetland restoration, could be about salt marshes, could be about bogs, could be about swamps, could be about something in the Midwest, could be about something in California. I don't, I don't, I don't particularly care. Right, and so um, there's various ways you can do this. You can search for the words wetland restoration. You can search for ecological restoration, wetland ecological restoration. You can search, search for the type that you are most interested in. You can search for salt marsh wetland restoration. Right. You can search for restoration performance, restoration, however you would like to do that. Um, and uh, what I'd like you guys to try, ideally, so we have about five minutes before we go, and so. It, Screw it, I'm out of time. Maybe we'll just pick this up next week. What I'd like you guys to do is, it, let me just show you this here. So in trying to figure out how to do this, so since we're all asynchronous, right? I don't want, we all, I want to get different references, right? We need, for this exercise to work, we all need to get different references. And I wasn't sure of an easy way to do this. If you guys have other suggestions from your other classes, how, how maybe some of your other faculty have done this, love to hear it. But here's my idea. My idea is, um, so we have to, we'll go and we'll, I have a, a, a spreadsheet you guys will fill out and type this information in. But for the actual, just first getting the references, my thought was you guys, I have a Google form and you guys could put this in and you guys could all check then the responses and see if people found your reference or not. So first come, first serve in terms of when people get these references, right? If, if somebody has it, you can't use it. But if you're the first one, they can't use it. And so my thought is you can just type in your name, the author's last name, the year of the paper, the title of the paper is from this journal, and maybe what kind of wetland it's about, and then just upload the PDF here. Um, and, and that would be sort of you claiming that, you, that you'll do that reference. Um, and so... Uh, for this first little bit, or at least for this weekend, at least, all I want you guys to do is to try to do one. Eventually, I'm going to have everybody get 10 references. Um, but the first step is I just want you guys to try one and see if this form was going to work. So we're out of time to do that today. But does anybody have any other suggestions for how, if you were gathering literature in some of your other classes, how we avoid having 30 copies of the same, same one? Has anybody done this in any of their other online yeah. I'm so sorry. Couldn't we like put it on a spreadsheet because I feel like having to um, go click responses and have to like scroll through people's names. I don't know how um, in depth that platform is, but having, you know, just a spreadsheet where you can see on one page, like, you know, the yeah. first name and their corresponding author. I think that would be happy to do that. I thought this might be easier when we're, when you guys are just hunting, but if you guys want to just skip the stage and just stay in the, in the spreadsheet for the whole thing, the data entry and the claiming of the articles that, I mean, I'm fine with that. Other people have thoughts on that? I think that would work better for me as well. It would be easier to see. Okay. okay. Other people think, uh, generally speaking, that that's what you guys want to do, just, just have one spreadsheet. And so, so um, initially, though, initially, I want you guys to focus just on getting your references because it's, it's probably going to be a little bit of, of, of figuring out how to do the scoring. Um, and so the first, uh, and rather than get a reference and spending all this time trying to score it the first time, I like you guys just to get the references. And again, the only criteria is about wetland restoration and they, they have some amount of data after the restoration was complete. Could be 25 years, it could be whatever. It could be about a single restoration. It could be about four or five restorations, you know, or whatever. 
um, it, it's, it's all good. It just has to have a wetland focus. It has to have some data in there and something that you can you know, skim through and just sort of be able to bin into some of these gross categories. Does that make sense? Yes, Professor, that yeah. does. But before you said something about what not to do, what not to get. In the oh, just so, so sometimes people might publish a paper on how they would design a restoration or just the initial construction phase of a restoration. We don't want that. We want to have papers that are data from after the restoration has been complete. I mean, they might talk okay. about that in the paper. That's fine. But it just has to have some data on some aspect. It could be about species. It could be about functions. It could be about structure. It could be about whatever. But there needs to be some data on at least some elements of the functioning of the system after, uh, at some point in time after it's completed. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'll, I'll, I'll change this assignment up then. Um, so, so uh, I would encourage you guys to start looking for references right now, but, but it's, it will take me a little while to get that turned on since I'm changing this around. Um, and uh, the instructions will all be in there. I want you to focus on getting these references, getting initially just get one and make sure you're comfortable finding it. You want to get the reference downloaded as a PDF. And so we can have an archive of these things and we can go back and double check if we have questions. And then, um, and then we're going to, uh, uh, then you'll, you'll fill out the, the spreadsheet initially just with the reference. Here's my name. Here's the author's name, et cetera. And then um, I will, post some guides as to how you guys can score it. I want you guys to take a stab at it and probably next week we'll have a discussion because I'm sure there's, this, is, this is a hard assignment. So I'm sure there's going to be some, some wondering and you know, I, how do I bin this? And so we'll, we'll have some opportunity to work on that as a group next week. But, but the main thing is to find your references and make sure they're in there. And then it's up to you guys to double check and make sure nobody else already has that reference before you enter it into the, into the uh, spreadsheet. Cool? Cool. Beans? Okay, so then, so then that, that's it for today. Um, I will, uh, again, before you guys totally disappear, please do me a favor and go back to that, go back to our link, go back to our uh, Poll Everywhere link and just give me feedback on this lecture. Again, just the two questions. So just go back, if you, if you lost it, just type back in pollev.com, Sean Anderson 380, and just, and just content feedback anonymous and, and speed feedback anonymous. Other than that, I will see everybody virtually or uh, I will see you um, next week, if, if not virtually. Thanks, you guys. Dr. A, you got a minute? I do, let me just, let me just stop uh, the recording. Hold okay. on. Okay.